Bankless Nation, it is the third week of April. It's a special week. This only happens once every four years. I'm talking about the Bitcoin halving. David, it is Bitcoin halving week. How are you celebrating? Uh, I'm, actually, I'm actually throwing a party now that you asked. <laughs> are you really? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Which all my friends are like, why Why are you throwing a party? Is it a having party? party? Yeah, it's a having party, yeah. No way. Uh -huh. what, yeah. what do you do? Like, what do you do? For oh, I just invite friends over and I feed them drinks. <laughs> talk about Bitcoin? Yeah, talk, talk about, about Bitcoin. Sound money? Yeah. Ha yeah. Ha hand out uh, the Bitcoin standard? <laughs> yeah, Safe a moose? If you, well, you you know, I have a signed copy of the Bitcoin standard by Safe <laughs> I know you moose. do. Yeah. This is a tree story. It's, true it's story. addressed I to uh, the shit corner, uh, which is me. Yeah, well, uh, that that's great. That that's mm -hmm. accurate as well. So we, we got to start with that, though. We got to celebrate that because it happens only once every four years. Yeah. And uh, I think this is our second happening as a Bitcoin podcast. So as a Bitcoin podcast. That's right. That's funny. That was actually a slip of the tongue. I did Bitcoin podcast, <laughs> like, keeping it in. So you're having this party, David. But uh, the happening is scheduled to happen on Saturday. The big question I think in everyone's mind is: Is this going to be bullish or bearish for Bitcoin prices? What about We've my bags, some, David? We got some takes in the uh, show to talk about that. Uh, Worldcoin and OKX are releasing their layer twos. Do we need more layer twos? How will they differ? Will they bring new users on chain? In addition to more layer twos, Kraken is also opening up their own wallet, their beautiful wallet, which I've got my phone. We'll debut that here in a second. Uh, what's, uh, what's the deal about the Kraken wallet? Open source, privacy first. It's great. What else we got talking about, Ryan? Hong Kong. They are front running the US. They just got their Ethereum ETF, okay? In addition to a Bitcoin ETF, they got an Ethereum ETF. So the question is, does this mean big inflows in Asia? We'll talk about that. And the next Ethereum upgrade is going to make Ethereum wallets great again. <laughs> they, they could use a... Uh, an upgrade, I would say. So we'll talk about that. Also, alt restaking is mm -hmm. now a thing? Question mm -hmm. mark. What is this? Non eigenlayer restaking? And then last up, Solana is patching their chain, deployed a patch to uh, account for some of the uh, transaction spam that's going in. Uh, and now Solana is no longer broken. Uh, Solana is now fixed, but there is still a roadmap to uh, perfect the engineering around the Solana ecosystem. So we'll talk about that perfection, and more. Perfection, huh? Search perfection. of perfection. Per perfecting, uh, we're all in perfection search of, of perfection. Yeah. Okay. So uh, before we get in, we got to shout out our friends over at safe wallet mm -hmm. it is account abstraction season i feel like this sure. is going to be a massive year for ethereum wallets safe is the wallet that bankless use uses to secure all of its funds mm -hmm. so this has been a wallet uh, we trusted for a while and they got something cool coming up what what do they want folks in the bankless nation to know yeah, so a safe is actually probably everyone's first account abstraction wallet on, especially on the layer one. They've there's they've held over a hundred billion dollars of TVL since Gnosis Safe was deployed like forever ago. Uh, safe is building the on-chain ownership layer with now smart accounts. They're trying to forge a future where smart accounts are embedded within every app on the web, on the entire mm. internet, not just Ethereum. Hmm. So we can give the internet ownership over assets and data and identity. They want you to build with a safe smart account. There is a link in the show notes so you can get started building with a safe smart account. And also they want you to go to SafeCon, that's May 23rd in Berlin. Uh, and so if you are interested in building with safe or building an account abstraction, or you're just in Berlin or Europe, uh, go to SafeCon. There's a link in the show notes for that as well. David, before we get to the prices though, and, and markets, I think we need to spend a minute to talk about the Bitcoin having, more okay. Having, more having content. Yeah, more having content uh, on this Bitcoin podcast that you, you, you've come to appreciate. Um, mm -hmm. All right, so we are this, according to this timer, we are at the time of recording one day until the having. So right. does one this day in mean, six hours. Is this going to happen on April 19th then? By the time people get this episode, will it be having day? Um, it, I think it actually might depend on where you are in the world. I think only maybe Hawaii is going to have the Bitcoin having on 420. Everyone else will have it on 419. Oh, okay. So I think uh, this happens like uh, 10 p.m. Like 10, maybe, maybe the West Coast also has it in 422. But I think this happens like 10 p.m. Eastern time uh, on Friday tomorrow. Uh, today for the time of listeners. Do, do we need to recap like what the happening a actually is? God, happening I hope not, is? but I think we're going to do it anyways. Okay, uh, so what is it? So for every 210,000 blocks, so 210,000 blocks times 10 minutes gives you approximately every four years, the Bitcoin reward for mining a Bitcoin block gets cut in half. The Bitcoin uh, reward for mining the first Bitcoin blocks was 50 Bitcoins per block, back when Bitcoin was literally valueless. Um, and then it went from 50 to 25 in 2012. It went from 25 to 12 and a half in 2016, 12 and a half to 6.25 in May of 2020. And now, uh, tomorrow, in today for, for listeners, 
uh, it's going to go from 6.25 down to 3.125 Bitcoin per block. So this is the fourth one out of, uh, you know, uh, I guess there's been three previous and we have some history. So a question in everyone's mind is what is price going to do? Because everyone knows this is written in the code of Bitcoin. It's been here since inception. Everyone knows what's going to happen. There's always this question of have people front run this? Is the market already priced it in? What's going to happen to price? This is a tweet from Bitwise doing some analysis on this. What, What do they say? They just basically show the returns on Bitcoin for the year after the happening. Um, and so for 2012, it was a whopping 8,800% uh, price appreciation. Oh, okay. Is that what sorry, we can expect? <laughs> sorry, big listeners, you should not be expecting that. Be nice, uh, in though. 2016, it was 285%. And then in okay. 2020, it was 550%. So we have yet to have, out of three data points, we're about to have the fourth, we are yet to have a bearish year post happening for Bitcoin. Historically, it's always been real good. Real good. After the happening, between two hundred and eighty-five percent and eight thousand eight hundred and thirty-nine percent. I will well, say actually, so both twenty sixteen and twenty twenty, which were very strong performing years for Bitcoin, it was actually the year after those years that were the the better of those two years. So in twenty sixteen, Bitcoin was up something like like a thousand percent. And in 2021, Bitcoin was also up something it's even higher. Now, people say this this time could be different, of course, mm-hmm. because like maybe be we maybe we front ran some of that demand. We got a Bitcoin ETF sure. in January, which was a few years. We've never had a Bitcoin ETF before, so maybe it's different in that way. But also, there, there's something that happens in the month following the happening, which is the month mm-hmm. we're in. So if you're like a near-term one-month trader, what has traditionally happened in the month after the happening? Nothing significant. Uh, in 2012, we were up 9%. In 2016, we were down 10%. And in 2020, we were up 6%. And so basically, so, it's saying, hey, like, zoom out, think long term, don't think about like, don't buy Bitcoin now because of the happening is tomorrow. Like, yeah. think about so, it on like a longer time frame than that. I mean, you say it's not significant, and I agree. Like, but the significance is it's super flat in the month after, right? And mm-hmm. then, like, so don't expect this to get like immediately priced in. I mean, the right, market's of kind of uh, anticipating this. Uh, right. I suppose Every, everyone has seen the happening coming. It has been in the code since Genesis. Yes. Um, all right. So there is something that is actually shipping with this happening, and has mm-hmm. nothing to do with the Bitcoin Core protocol. So it's not like the the code itself is right. undergoing any upgrade, but simultaneous with the uh, having is the shipping of Bitcoin runes. What, what's the significance of that? Why is, why is that happening on the having? Yeah, so if you are paying attention to Bitcoin land, runes is like the very hyped thing that is being released. Uh, the code, the core, the Bitcoin software for runes is being released tomorrow. This is uh, Casey Rodemore who created Bitcoin ordinals. NFTs on Bitcoin using Bitcoin as like a data availability layer of sorts just to inscribe JPEGs on the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, He has since figured out a way to do a very similar thing, creative construction of the nooks and crannies of Bitcoin block space to produce fungible tokens inside of Bitcoin, like enshrined on the layer one. This is not a layer two on Bitcoin. This is not like a side chain to Bitcoin. This is inside of the layer one fungible tokens uh, using Bitcoin block space. Uh, and so this is a very hype thing in Bitcoin land. This is launching with a happening. Uh, we did a show with Casey yesterday. It came out yesterday. Uh, if you want to learn more about it, um, probably one of the more hyped things that I've heard in the Bitcoin I think it's a big deal. I think, time. I think these are le- like more le- like the most legit Bitcoin tokens uh, idea yes. that uh, we, we've seen so far. And w- why is uh, Casey releasing this on, ha- on having just because? Why the just hell like- not? Yeah. Yeah, why yeah. not? So it's nothing to do with it. He's just uh, chose this as a shelling yep. point. Uh, very mm-hmm. cool. All right. So what about prices on the week? Where are we at on the Bitcoin price? Down about 10%. Start of the week, a little bit above 70000 currently at $62,500. So uh, thanks to Kraken Pro for these charts, even though they are down. Make them, I make wish them go uh, up. make them go up. Yeah, please, Kraken, help help us with that. Um, I feel like it was a rough week. Look at look at some of these red uh, it has spikes been rough. downwards. It has been a rough couple of weeks. Hasn't yeah, it? it's just like, especially over the weekend, there were some spikes yeah. downwards. And the question, of course, when we go down, mostly when we go down, Why? people don't ask these questions. Why, why did we, we go, go down? <laughs> when we go up, it's like, oh, we knew this Duh. was going to happen. It's inevitable, you know? But like when we go down, we need some sort of rational explanation for this. Yeah. And uh, there are a few different explanations people yeah. have turned to. Uh, what are they? Uh, Well, there's always the tax scapegoat. Uh, So April 15th was tax day in the United States. Is it it tax day just in the United States or is that like a global day? 
Oh, do, do other people pay ta- use April 15th for taxes or is it just I, us? I don't know. I, you know, I honestly don't know. I've never paid taxes, income taxes in another country, David. So I, yeah. I just don't know. Yeah, yeah. But so April 15th, you have to get your, you, you, you have to pay your taxes. taxes. IRS. And so yes. like, if you don't have the money in your bank account, then you have to sell your assets in order to pay for your taxes. Do you and think so, people do this? Do you think people are like, it's April 14th? I don't 14th, know what other like, people's strategies oh, are. Oh no, <laughs> I, I, I owe like thousands of dollars. I better sell some Bitcoin to go pay this. Yeah, like if you are like buzzer beating the <laughs> selling of your assets to pay for your taxes, is I, I, do people do that? I don't really know. This is why people know. always don't really know like whether the tax sell off is real or just noise. Um, but we can use it as it a could be one of those week. reflexive things where everyone thinks it's a thing, so sure. it becomes a thing. Yeah. <laughs> So, right. anyways, it's scapegoat one. number one, taxes. Uh, scapegoat another number two, uh, Iran versus Israel. Markets do not like uncertainty. They do not like war. They do not like instability. Uh, and so, over the weekend, Iran sent some drones and missiles over to Israel, which were intercepted. Uh, people were worried about this being escalating into a regional conflict. Uh, the meme is that this would turn into World War III, which is definitely bad for markets. Uh, and so that's scapegoat number three. Um, or you uh, say scapegoat. Two. This one to me felt kind of legitimate. Felt, though. felt real. Over the weekend, <laughs> I was like, whoa, drones and missiles? Uh, I was also wait, like what's slightly going worried. On? Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. All right. So maybe some legitimacy there, at least from my perspective. Uh, what else we got? Uh, scapegoat number three, <laughs> BTC inflows kind of muted. Uh, we've actually had not any net new inflows into the Bitcoin ETFs for almost like a month now. Uh, so while there are increasing, there are our flows into the new Bitcoin ETFs, there are similar outflows out of Grayscale. So there's no net new TVL going into the Bitcoin ETFs for about a month, which is you know coincidentally how long we've been about flat for. Okay, so maybe inflows have kind of like stopped, and people see that, mm-hmm. and you know they're like, okay, well the party, the ETF party's over. Uh, mm-hmm. What else we got? Scapegoat number four: uh, stock market's down. Actually, uh, so the SPY is actually like a good fifty points off its high. Uh, so down like I think fifteen percent. So SPY down four and a half percent off of the high. Uh, look, we got Ryan to to do that little charty chart thing. Yeah, thanks. So. Um, yeah. Uh, so I mean, five percent off of the SPY is like. That's like a big deal. For, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. So 5% down? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Come on, guys. Oh, the global economy is 5% off. You want to uh, be a real investors are just like crypto volatility, <laughs> all right? Yeah. Try me Anyways, uh, SPY goes down 5%. Crypto is going to catch a cold. Uh, yeah. And so that's, well, that's what's happened. You know what's interesting about this <laughs> is, um, okay, so uh, gold has been up. Gold Relentlessly pumping. up. On like the Gold's last pumping. month, and mm-hmm. like the like news over the weekend did not stop g- goals ascent. So. Is, cri- is crypto, is Bitcoin trading like a risk-off asset? I thought it was like a digital gold. Right. Uh, and it's been interesting that it hasn't been trading like that. So you would think, at least some narratives w- would say that um, global turmoil equals, mm-hmm. of course, like you know, wars, and like rumors of wars, uh, governments are going to print money, aren't they, in order to pay for right. this stuff and show, shouldn't a non-state uh, store of value pump? Um, you know, gold has. Why, why not Bitcoin? You have any takes? Uh, yeah, uh, I don't know what, why gold is pumping. Obviously, I'm not like a macro expert. Uh, it is a little bit sus that like people were talking about gold pumping and then right into the Iran conflict. Um, but what the hell do I know? Overall, just like the whole hopium for the setup right now uh, is just like basically the inverse of all of these things. Like the tax sell off isn't real or it's behind us now. Iran versus Israel actually stabilizes. Eventually, the inflows into the Bitcoin ETFs will surpass the outflows out of Grayscale. That is also just an inevitability. And, you know, the SPY can't go down forever. It's also designed to go up only. Uh, and we are currently oversold in the world of the RSI indicator, if you are a believer of such a thing. Uh, what does that mean? That just means like you can't have that many selling days in a row before there's a buying day. Yeah, there'll and be some recovery, right? There'll be some recovery. At and least like, in the short run. If 2% increase in the SPY is like, you know, a 20% increase in Bitcoin. Oh, you know what? We didn't have, there's a number five explanation actually we didn't cover, which is like the Fed is definitely um, talking about delaying the reduction of interest rates, right? Inflation's burning a little hot and that's kind of bled over. So if you want another reason, there's a fifth reason for you. Also, you know what? The happening, it's also bullish. (laughs) (laughs) Here's the thing though, you got to put this into perspective and here's a good tweet to keep this in perspective. There have only been 38 days in all of Bitcoin history where we've ever had a closing price uh, where we currently are, which is Mm -hmm. above 61K, like above 60K. Actually, are we above 60K at the time of recording? I mean, somewhere close to that, right? Yeah, we are. 62 and a half. Yeah, yeah. We we, we never got down below 60K. 
it's only been 38 days. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, so, I mean, we're in the, kind of the, the same range mm -hmm. of all-time highs that we've been in for the last, you know, like month and a half. There's some perspective for you. We haven't really experienced price discovery in crypto yet. So Bitcoin broke through the $69,000 all-time highs to get to like up to 20, 73, 74. That's, that's not price discovery. No well, one no David, one has experienced price discovery. You're getting your wish. A nice slow right. bull that's run. That's exactly you're what I was going with. You're getting your wish. Yeah. Like breaking out uh, out through all time highs and then achieving like escape velocity to the moon that should be hard. Like feels healthy. It feels healthy. It feels healthy. Let's draw this place out. Let's like the normies aren't here yet. Like it's still just <laughs> us. Like enjoy this time. All right. Well, so uh, how about ETH price? Are we doing something similar? Uh, yeah, down thirteen percent. Start of the week, thirty five hundred dollars. Ending the week, where we are now at thirty thousand four hundred dollars. Got all the way down. I mean, that was a that harsh way. spike. I'm not. I'm. No way was that real. What? Yeah, is that's this, real. Oh my god! Wow, that's real. Yeah, okay. Didn't you look on at the, the charts over the weekend? On the, I didn't. I'm not during that blip where hi, Ryan is highlighting a a yeah. wick down to two thousand five hundred and thirty dollars. Uh, yikes! Wow. Uh, no wonder so many people got liquidated last week. Um, uh, no. What is this? Four hour candle? No four hour candle lasted. Went below two thousand nine hundred dollars. Um, so yeah, that's pretty low. $2,500. Great buying opportunity. Low. If you snipe yeah. some, con con congrats to anyone who sniped that. Who, yeah. th this is why it's always nice to have uh powder available with like, call it, we call these stink bids. Just like stink bids. St you never heard we of call them stink bids. I, well, yeah. Tra traders never, call these stink, bird, stink I'm not, bids. I'm not, I'm not of it, your kind. It's, David. it's when you set a limit order so unreasonably low that you just hope that you like kind of win a lottery with like some volatility. Ah, uh, so you have those. It's basically uh, kind of like a put. limit order. Like it's a on spot. There. It's a spot market put. Yeah. Stink All right. Bid. So what? What's your stink bid at right now for this market? <laughs> you got any? I, I don't have. I any still. Stink I still have my triple digit stink bids. That <laughs> yeah, you are. Those are those are not getting filled. And those are not getting filled. Yeah, <laughs> I think I've capitulated on that. Uh, let's talk yeah. about ETH gas price though. Uh, yeah. Real high, actually. Yeah. Almost 500 guay at certain points. That is we, real we expensive. We experienced a one-hour period of negative 10% deflation of ETH supply because okay. of all the liquidation. So that's a nice that's a nice ETH holder framing on it. But mm -hmm. like for the users, it's really expensive. What's nice about this, uh, David Michal is is showing there's a bifurcation in terms of gas market. What's he, what's mm -hmm. he saying here? Yeah, so the Ethereum layer one experienced 500 guay gas prices. Uh, Ethereum blob price. So like blob space for layer twos, completely unaffected by yeah. the congestion fees on the layer one. So yeah. layer twos were completely buffered from all of the liquidations and shenanigans and congestion happening at the layer one. So if you if you were on base or optimism or Arbitrum or ZK Sync or Polygon, you had absolutely no awareness or concern about the congestions of the layer one. It's like it's like getting stuck in a traffic jam and then you look over and there's that high occupancy vehicle lane and cars and are just, just like whistling by. Zooming. Just, just zooming. Full speed ahead. Don't care about you. Yeah. That's what was going on. And it's mm -hmm. great because now for the first time post blob space, there are two separate markets for this as, mm -hmm. as it should be. So the question is, what are the prices on ETH layer twos? Is that still yeah. uh, hanging down? What are we looking at? Yeah, so this is a brand new website, part of the website of growthepod.xyz, which if you are interested in just looking at the fee dynamics, the economics of layer twos, this is definitely the website for you. So fees.growthepie.xyz is this new website. It just shows you the fees for all the different chains. Uh, 0.15 cents, not 15 cents, 0.15 cents to transfer ETH on Zora, 0.41 cents to swap fees on Zora. Under Most a people, real cheap. Yes, under everything, everything is Fractions under a Fractions of a penny. Here. Yeah, the only the only systems that are above a penny are si systems that are not yet using blob space. Um, mm. So Linnea, Linnea, not yet using blob space. Um, uh, they are actually actually. I can sort the, yeah, I can sort this, but okay, look at this. Uh, they are, but like, oh, see, wow. look at this. You can right, sort so by expensive. date availability blobs. I don't know. Linnea wow. is just it's premium, premium stuff. It's good stuff over there. All right, Linnea. good stuff over there. <laughs> Must All right, be. let's see. What's the cheapest thing to... Uh, Arbitrum is the cheapest uh, chain to swap tokens on for 0.65 cents. What a deal. What a deal. Nice. I see some trades nice. over in Arbitrum these nice. days. Crypto market cap, where are we hanging in? Uh, $2.4 trillion. Dollars. Two point four. Uh, let's do a, another quick look at uh, Layer 2s in the Layer 2 world. David, you got some stats for us. This uh, update, of course, is brought to you by one of our favorite Layer 2s, uh, which is Mantle. Um, they're always placed quite high on the charts, Number hanging in at number five. Um, what, do, what do you want to look at this week? Yeah, so drop down below $30, $40 billion in TVL on Layer 2s. We're at mm -hmm. an 11x scaling factor, uh, so 11 Ethereums on Layer 2s. 
Um, so these numbers haven't really changed, but I think what is cool actually is uh, we, we talked about layer two beat for all the layer twos, but now we're, we're moving on to layer threes right now. I don't know if you've noticed this. Uh, yeah. Base, which is a Arbitrum orbit chain that settles down to the base chain. Okay. Which settles down to Ethereum. Okay. Arbitrum, the DGEN layer three is now doing the most transactions per second out of all of no, all the layer twos. <laughs> okay, so a layer three is a uh -huh. layer three just a, a layer, a chain built on top of a layer two. Is That's it really exactly that simple? Right. It's really that simple. Yeah. Okay, so there is a chain called DGen chain, mm -hmm. which is killing it in terms of transactions per second, and that is just built on top of the base chain, which is built yep. on top of Ethereum. Yep. So so DGen chain is the number one chain that's on a layer two that's doing the most transactions per second and the number two uh transactions per second chain is base which is where dgen chain settles to okay uh i just have one question for you david sure when layer four <laughs> okay so we, i don't <laughs> like, we could just like keep stacking them <laughs> i don't think any i think it stops at the layer three level on for technical uh for like all chain it kind of just stops at layer threes if you are doing a layer four it's because you are doing it for the meme you can do that. There's I nothing stopping to. you. I want to do but that. You I want to build do that. on top of DGEN. Yeah, yeah you, should, you should ask Andrew from Quando. You're going to need some help on that one. <laughs> Settle on top of DGEN. David, what do we have coming up? WorldCoin is going from its app to a chain. We're getting World Chain. If you didn't have enough Layer 2s, well, you just got another one. But this one's different. So if you are a verified human, you will be given a first-class treatment on World Chain. We're going to talk mm. about that. Uh, OKX. Also doing another chain. They're doing another. <laughs> layer We're two, still though. talking about layer twos. Uh, which framework did they choose? Huh? Uh, and then also Kraken, congrats guys, launched their wallet. Privacy first, open source, and absolutely beautiful. I'm going to show you all. Ryan, I'm going to show you all my NFTs that are on my Kraken wallet. Okay. Uh, and I got them in there. Uh, so we're going to get to all of that and more. But first, we're going to hear directly from Kraken, our preferred exchange and now wallet. If you do not have an account with Kraken or if you haven't downloaded their wallet, go get a link. the wallet. Go get the wallet. Yeah, go do that. And then make your account with Kraken. Let's go hear from them right now. If you want a crypto trading experience backed by world class security and award winning support teams, then head over to Kraken, one of the longest standing and most secure crypto platforms in the world. Kraken is on a journey to build a more accessible, inclusive, and fair financial system, making it simple and secure for everyone, everywhere, to trade crypto. Kraken's intuitive trading tools are designed to grow with you, empowering you to make your first or your hundredth trade in just a few clicks. And there's an award-winning client support team available 24-7 to help you along the way, along with a whole range of educational guides, articles, and videos. With products and features like Kraken Pro and Kraken NFT Marketplace and a seamless app to bring it all together, Together, it's really the perfect place to get your complete crypto experience. So check out the simple, secure, and powerful way for everyone to trade crypto, whether you're a complete beginner or a seasoned pro. Go to kraken.com slash bankless to see what crypto can be. Not investment advice, crypto trading involves risk of loss. Have you heard about SAFE? They're not just pioneers in crypto custody, they're also leading the transition to the world of smart accounts. With SAFE, managing your crypto has never been smarter or safer. They've recently passed a hundred billion dollars in total value secured and are now deployed everywhere with over 15 supported networks. But that's not all. SAFE is revolutionizing the game with their full compatibility with ERC4337, making embedding wallets super easy to integrate into your daily crypto activities. So what are you waiting for? Head over to safe.global to join over 8 million others in securing your crypto. And while you're there, don't forget to check out SafeCon, happening during the Berlin Blockchain Week, where the future of smart accounts is unfolding in real life. Secure your spot today and be a part of the transition to smart accounts. Click the link in the show notes to learn more and take your first steps towards smarter crypto management. Taking self-custody of your crypto is one of the most important things you can do on your bankless journey. It's also one of the hardest things to get right, with huge consequences if you don't. If you want help going bankless, talk to Casa. Casa helps you take custody of your crypto assets so you don't have to wonder whether you're doing it right. Casa is a one-stop shop for doing self-custody the right way. With Casa vaults, you can hold Ether, Bitcoin, stablecoins, all with one simple app and multiple keys for the ultimate peace of mind with a support team to help you every step of the way. But it doesn't stop at self-custody because even though crypto is forever, you are not. We all plan on making life-changing wealth in crypto, but with Casa's inheritance product, life-changing wealth can elevate to generational wealth for your kids and your loved ones who don't know anything about crypto. With Casa, you won't lose your private keys and you won't accidentally take them to the grave either. Click the link in the description to get started securing your generational wealth. Not to overshadow the happening david but um it is chain week it is layer two week on bankless as well okay uh we got two big layer two announcements one one of them just went live on on uh, mainnet so let's start there uh world coin introduced world 
chain. All right, the last I heard about WorldCoin, they were trying to you know stick orbs in everyone's faces and scan your eyeballs. Oh, they're still doing that? Still doing that, yeah. So I had seen, I think, a headline that they got to about 5 million humans with like iris scans. So that's the level. Anyway, that aside, what are they doing? What is WorldChain? So WorldChain has always been a part of the WorldCoin vision. Uh, so anyone who's been like uh, deep in the WorldCoin world, this actually is not a surprise. Uh, it is an OP stack fork. It is a part of the SuperChain collective, um, but it has a very intimate technical relationship with its own World ID and WorldCoin app. Uh, and so if you verify yourself, your iris, I mean, uh, within the world coin system, you are a verified human on the world chain and you actually get subsidized transactions on world chain as in free, not infinitely free, uh, but I'm sure this model is going to change. But the idea is really to bifurcate humans from bots on world chain. Uh, and so if you are a human, because you are proven to be human because of your iris, so you're like, you you get a private key that's associated with your iris. Uh, you get to have first class, uh, a first class position on WorldChain. Uh, a, a couple of things, you know, WorldCoin as an app so far is about 44% of OP mainnet's activity. Yeah. At this point, I didn't realize. Which I, it was I that think high. it's a part of the world world coin system because like verifying a human and putting the, their iris, the hash date of your iris on chain. Uh, I think that's how that works. Uh, so. And they're 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 launching this. You, did you say this as an OP uh, you know, like stack an, chain? It's an so, OP stack chain inside of the collective. Okay, so they're they're joining the super chain. So mm -hmm. eventually, all of these will be integrated. You know, uh, feelings aside, people have lots of passionate feelings about uh, your know, world world chain and right. using biometric data mm -hmm. to identify humans uh, and all of that. Don't want to step. We've had that conversation before. Yeah. And just not stepping into that conversation. The idea of having a chain that is human aware. Mm -hmm. Right, any sort of block space that is human aware is new. That's and really cool. I think that's, that's cool actually concept. it's interesting, right? Because, well, we have all sorts of civil resistant problems, not just mm -hmm. in crypto, but or sorry, not just on the client on the internet, but like even specifically crypto, like in the here and now. It's like I want to provide an airdrop to all of my real human users. Mm -hmm. How do I do that? I have no idea. You could be yeah, like a bot farm account with like like hundreds of different accounts. And by the way, I'm not saying that uh, World WorldCoin World Coin isn't gameable because I've also seen some like ways mm -hmm. where it can be gamed. But it is at least better. It is more civil resistant than just like being able to spin up any sort of wallet and like tr you know track it that way. So human aware block space, human aware chain, uh, where we can tell who the real people are and who who the bots are. Um, do you think that's significant? Yeah, and I think that we won't really know how or why it's significant. We won't have examples for this until like they meaningfully get built. But really, like the whole idea is that we have this platform to do th activities and behaviors that we haven't had before. Uh, and that really starts with uh, having some decent levels of assurances that devs building on this block space uh, gets to know that they are actually having individual humans as their users rather than getting bot farmed. And so like the the blast layer two pitch is like, yo, we have native yield. So come build on our uh, platform, come put, put your money on, on our platform. And the world chain pitch is like, yo, we have real individual non civil humans. So therefore come build on our platform. Zooming out for a second, uh, you and I have talked about this like um, recently, and I think we want to do an entire episode on this, like mm -hmm. the, the dead internet theory. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the dead internet theory? The dead internet theory is um, this theory that came, I came across from this various AI conversations. It's this online conspiracy theory. I'm like four for four on conspiracy theories in the podcast <laughs> in the last weeks, by the way. Okay. Um, it's a bigger one, though. It, it, it asserts that now the internet is actually mostly bots and the activity of the internet is mostly bots. And the uh, content generated on the internet on Facebook is actually mostly bots. And so like the internet is actually a human devoid place. And now we're getting to the point where like, it's bots consuming content by bots, producing content for bots. And actually like a lot of the commerce of like startups and internet companies are actually just like, it's actually bots facilitating bots and we actually don't know it. And so the internet is actually more dead than we actually assume. It's, a, uh, it's like a bunch of bots pretending to be humans too, right? Exactly, exactly. Okay, so, but, but, so you, you said, you pitch that as a conspiracy theory. I think the framing of it, of like saying that internet theory, like 
I, I you know if you if you were to say there are no humans on the internet uh, right. anymore, that would be like very far and kind of the right. conspiracy. But like what you just said, I don't consider that a cons- like that's evident. I mean, go yeah, go try to interact that's on the, Twitter. At, at the very Reddit. least, it's the trend. Right. And like with all of the AI content and like deep fake type ability Mm -hmm. you have, like it's going to continue to do that. I mean, you're not going to know whose Instagram account is real apart from some sort of proof of personhood uh, type of protocol. Right. I guess that's the entire point of world chain uh, or world coin and and maybe uh, world chain. But um, Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't I don't know how much of a conspiracy theory it is. Like that's right. Like Like, what's self-evidently going on. You could be listening to a podcast and one of them might be a bot. You just don't know. One of the know. hosts of the, the host. podcast, yeah. your favorite podcast that you listen you just, to. You, you don't just even know if that know. person's a, a real human yeah. or not. That's not the only layer two that we need to talk about this week. Uh, OKX, which is a crypto exchange, one of the world's largest, you know, top mm-hmm. three, top five, something like this, just launched X Layer. This is a layer two uh, on Ethereum. Um, it is, I believe, a ZK EVM. I think it's mm-hmm. built on the Polygon stack. What else do we need to know? Uh, it's also one of the first chains to use the Polygon ag layer. So if you've been paying attention to like chain development in this space, uh, Polygon has really been promoting their like ag layer solution for global liquidity interoperability, not just for Polygon chains, but just actually kind of anyone. Uh, and so this chain, the OKX X layer, which we're going to get this confused with Twitter X, but whatever. Uh, so they're using ag layer. And so all of the chains that tap into the Polygon ag layer can actually share liquidity with each other, like perfectly interoperable liquidity. So more chains that leverage the ag layer all kind of add, a, add to a central liquidity pool. Uh, and there's also going to be the OKB token as the native token on X layer. Uh, interesting that they're calling it X chain or X layer instead of X chain. Um, I like that. I like that change of pace. Uh, and so you can, act, they will also be able to use this to pay the transaction fees thanks to the ag layer. Yeah, I think this is a big deal because this is another major exchange that has entered the space, thrown their hat in the ring. And like there's, you know, the, the meme of, is this the base for Polygon? So mm-hmm. it's another large exchange. It's outside the US, uh, of course, primarily. And it is on a different um, layer two stack, which is Polygon instead of Optimism and gets the benefit from ag layer uh, from the start, which is, again, composability across the entire Polygon ecosystem of chains. So if we do a rundown, David, of an exchanges with an Ethereum layer two at this point, we've got Coinbase, all right? We know about base chain. Bybit is associated mm-hmm. with Mantle. They've kind of like funded that and brought that to market. Now we By, have Bybit OKX. turned themselves into a DAO and then that DAO produced their own chain, which is Mantle. Yeah, now we have OKX doing one. There, there are two other exchanges kind of on my list, which is like Kraken and Binance. And by the way, there's been rumor that Kraken is sort of like investigating there has been a rumors. layer two, yeah, right? They won't tell so, us though. And then Binance, uh, they, they have a side chain effectively right. that I think there's a roadmap for it to become a layer two if that ever made sense. So I think it's only a matter of time before all of the major exchanges have their own layer twos. And this is something that we've predicted for a long time actually on mm-hmm. Bankless. Uh, not to just pat ourselves on the back. We, I guess we sometimes we do that. We do that. Bit, but... Yeah, we do that. Okay, not so for too much but like too. first, it's the exchanges. Then mm-hmm. I think it's going to be the banks because mm-hmm. what's the next proximate thing to an exchange? It's probably a fintech company like a PayPal, for instance, mm-hmm. or like a Revolut, or like a, a TransferWise, or something like this. And then eventually we'll get to the stage where what? What are banks anyway? They're all side chains. They're, They're all, all ledgers. ledgers. They're all ledgers. So if they a settle on top of a global settlement system, if they settle on top of Ethereum, they become a layer two, or mm-hmm. maybe a layer three, or maybe layer four. I don't know. But mm-hmm. some sort of uh, chain on top that's settling. So we're just knocking them, knocking them down from my perspective. And um, that's why I'm, I'm super excited that exchanges are now going uh, m- like towards crypto nativity and becoming a mm-hmm. bit more a blockchain native. One thing I think might be cool to see is that it, it, banks are always just going to have a hard time getting comfortable with this. So I could I could totally see some like trad banks, some like you know TradFi, Wells Fargo esque bank making a, a layer two on Ethereum, but actually it's private and only for them, as yeah. in like they're the only ones with right access. Uh, and but then they give like select parties read access. Maybe maybe it's an encrypted layer two. I don't know. We had, that technology is not here yet, but it will be. Uh, but like some sort of just like they just leverage a blockchain for their internal accounting and as like an insurance mechanism and efficiency mechanism for themselves. 
And then they can like, they elect to go up and down between Ethereum layer one and their private layer two that they control. I think that, I don't know if that future is a thing, but I, I could totally I mean, see it. JP Morgan has a, a chain. Uh, <clears throat> right. It's formerly called uh, Quorum or they're do, it's mm -hmm. just basically a private blockchain. It's just not right. public. Mm -hmm. And making the transition to make aspects of that, that um, public in settled mm -hmm. to Ethereum could be a thing. So uh, really cool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, speaking of Kraken, who does not have a chain yet, but maybe they will one day, they do have a wallet, though. And if you're going to build a wallet, you're getting pretty close to building a chain. I'm just yeah, saying. What's the next step? Uh, here's, here's my Kraken wallet. I loaded up uh, my crypto coven, an old NFT that I have. I think it's pretty pretty. It's uh, have, you, have you opened oh, up your wallet? Go. Yeah. Have you opened uh, up your Kraken wallet? There, there it is. That looks beautiful. Um, it does look beautiful. Yeah. I, so I downloaded it. I um, started with a, a fresh set of keys. You already got stuff mm -hmm. on there. So how did you do it? Well, I have a, a seed phrase of like my petty cash that I keep on my phone. And so all the wallets that I use, I just load up the same seed phrase. Yeah. Uh, nice, nice trick, actually. So what do you, um, what do you think so far? Uh, it's nice and purple. It's the crack. <laughs> uh, it's absolutely beautiful. Uh, let's see. So we, you have different chains. You have all the assets, right? Uh, it was really nice to see my NFTs in there that I wanted to see. And all the spam ones were not in there by default. So I didn't have to do anything with that. Uh, and then different chains. I don't think there's bridging yet. Um, so you can't bridge between layer twos, but you can send and receive on layer twos. Uh, there's also like Solana report, uh, um, support for people who like to play on Solana. Uh, but then there's also wallet connect. So like you can basically do anything inside of Ethereum DeFi via wallet connect. They're doing the cross uh, chain thing kind of nicely where it's just like all abstracted. So you don't have to know what chain you're on. You don't have to go get switch around like you do in some, some, uh, older wallets. So, uh, I really like that uh, from a behind the scenes perspective, David, Here's something I thought was cool. So the Kraken wallet is uh, open source, like completely mm -hmm. open source. So it is, and they're, they're the first exchange, I think, to, to ever do this. So it's available on GitHub so you can see how it's built. They've also built um, IP privacy as part of this, right? So it's a lot oh, of yeah. analytics that can be derived about, and they seem to be tailoring this to make crypto native people, folks, uh, feel secure that you know mm -hmm. their IP address hasn't been you know, like being collected and that kind of thing. So pretty on brand for Kraken, I'd say. Yeah, I think it's great. And I think bankless listeners, uh, again, like I have I'm in a place where I used to be like a single wallet type of person. Now I have mm -hmm. like multiple wallets. And mm -hmm. uh, this is gonna have a place on my phone. Um, it's not like a um, like perfect right out of the gate, but I expect Kraken's going to be improving it. And uh, yeah, a great, great, great start on this product. It's a foot in the door for Kraken to do something. Like, be more on chain again. Like, have their own chain. Uh, I, I expect this is like the first of like a direction for for Kraken. Like, no one ends in a wallet. Yeah, I totally agree. There, there's a link in the show notes if you guys want to check it out as well. Uh, David, let's talk about Hong Kong approving the spot Bitcoin and Ether ETF. So that was announced this week. So trading has <laughs> not yet begun. But that is announced. So the question is, is this a, a big deal? Is this going to bring like all of Asia's uh, like inflows into into crypto? Um, who has a good take here? I think this is uh, people are celebrating this just because we're actually kind of just trodden for it about our own lack of ETH ETFs inside of the United US, States. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I and mean, we have the Bitcoin ETFs, right? And so but we're but they are also getting the ETH ETF. Uh, is this going to move markets? Uh, Eric Balchuna says uh, probably not. Uh, the Hong Kong market is pretty tiny. Like the total market is only $50 billion. Just because it's approved in Hong Kong doesn't mean Chinese capital has access to this. So there's like a firewall between the capital of China and the capital of uh, um, Hong Kong. And also the three issuers, according to Eric Balchunas, are kind of tiny. There's no like big fish here. There's nothing like BlackRock. Uh, and then the fees on these things are about to be like 1% to 2%. So whereas it's like 0.2 to 0.3% for Bitcoin ETFs inside the United States, uh, Eric says it's likely going to be 1% to 2% inside of Hong Kong. So it's more about just like, hey, somebody else got an ETF. Yeah, th and we there didn't. is some symbolism, right? This is um, symbolism, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. like a, a Chinese uh, adjacent, China adjacent um, like jurisdiction uh, for certain. And for a jurisdiction kind of like famous for its capital controls, right? For them to get an Ethereum ETF be besides the United States, it, mm -hmm. there's probably some symbolism in, in that when you say like, if I was making the argument in, in front of like Congress, if I was like a, a Congress uh, representative who, who wanted to make the case, I'd, I'd just be like, Gary, Gary Gensler, okay? Hong Kong has an Ethereum ETF. Where are you? The whole world has an Ethereum ETF right now. Canada, Europe, like you can buy these ETP products. U.S. is the U.S. really going to be a laggard for this product? Sure. Maybe there's yeah. some ammo there that we glean from yeah. this. Yeah, so it's a symbolic victory. All right, it's a symbolic victory. We'll take it. We'll take any kind of ETF victory we can at this point, David. What what do we got coming up? 
Coming up next, Ethereum Layer 1 is actually getting a pretty big wallet upgrade, EIP-3074. We're going to tell you everything you need to know about that particular EIP. Solana has also got its patch, so it's easier to get a transaction through now. And 0x Maki, remember that name, Ryan? 0x Maki? Yeah. He awakens from retirement. What's he up to, and why is everyone murmuring about it? So we're going to get to all of this and more. But first, a moment to talk about some of these fantastic sponsors that make this show possible, especially Mantle. Who makes their own chain possible and to, so you can collect all the yield on it as well. Let's go hear from them right now. Mantle, formerly known as BitDAO, is the first DAO-led Web3 ecosystem, all built on top of Mantle's first core product, the Mantle Network, a brand new high-performance Ethereum Layer 2 built using the OP stack, but uses Eigenlayer's data availability solution instead of the expensive Ethereum Layer 1. Not only does this reduce Mantle Network's gas fees by 80%, but it also reduces gas fee volatility, providing a more stable foundation for Mantle's applications. The Mantle Treasury is one of the biggest DAO-owned treasuries, which is seeding an ecosystem of projects from all around the Web3 space for Mantle. Mantle already has sub-communities from around Web3 onboarded, like Game7 for Web3 Gaming and Bybit for TVL and Liquidity and OnRamps. So if you want to build on the Mantle network, Mantle is offering a grants program that provides milestone-based funding to promising projects that help expand, secure, and decentralize Mantle. If you want to get started working with the first DAO-led Layer 2 ecosystem, check out Mantle at mantle.xp. XYZ and follow them on Twitter at 0xmantle. Celo is the mobile-first, EVM-compatible, carbon-negative blockchain built for the real world. Driving real-world use cases like mobile payments and mobile DeFi, and with Opera Minipay as one of the fastest-growing Web3 wallets, Celo is seeing a meteoric rise with over 300 million transactions and 1.5 million monthly active addresses. And now, Celo is looking to come home to Ethereum as a Layer 2. Optimism, Polygon, Matter Labs, and Arbitrum have all thrown their hats in the ring for the Celo Layer 2 to build upon their stacks. Why the competition? The Celo Layer 2 will bring huge advantages like a decentralized sequencer, off-chain data availability secured by Ethereum validators, and one block finality. What does that all mean for you? With Celo Layer 2, gas fees will stay low and you can even pay for gas natively using ERC20 tokens, sending crypto to phone numbers across wallets using Social Connect. But Celo is a community-governed protocol. This means that Celo needs you to weigh in and make your voice heard. Join the conversation in the Celo forums, follow Celo on Twitter, and visit Celo.org to shape the future of Ethereum. Launching a token? Don't let complex legal and tax issues slow you down. Toku provides specialized support to optimize your launch and ensure that you as a founder and your team and your investors get the most tax efficient outcomes. The Toku team understands the crypto space inside and out and will ensure your token launch is fully compliant while maximizing tax efficiency. Toku can connect you with the best attorneys if you need them to make sure that you have the best advice and Toku can help to optimize your taxes so you pay the least possible amount of taxes while still maintaining legal compliance. With Toku's guidance, you can concentrate on building your company while Toku handles the logistics. Token launches don't have to be complicated. Talk to Toku today to get a free initial token valuation. Ethereum super wallets. That's what I'm calling them. I don't, I don't know if that'll catch on at all, but uh, this is a pretty cool upgrade and it's protocol level. It is coming mm -hmm. in the next Ethereum hard fork. It has, of course, an EIP. I'm going to have you recite because I don't yet have this one. 3074. 3074. I don't have this yeah. uh, memorized, but um, it is a pretty significant upgrade. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about it? This is account abstraction, which bankless listeners have heard countless times, which has generally been in the domain of layer twos. Uh, we all need account abstraction. Everyone needs account abstraction. Gosh, what is account abstraction? Basically, it puts logic into your wallet. So it turns your wallet, which is usually uh, just a dummy wallet. It is what's formally called as an externally owned account in EOA. It's basically just, just a public key and a private key with no logic in it whatsoever. Uh, smart accounts, smart contract wallets, account abstraction are trying to produce smart contract wallets. So your wallet is like a brain. It's got like chip, it's got logic in it, it's got expressivity. In the same way that Bitcoin is Bitcoin and Ethereum is Ethereum, externally owned accounts are like Bitcoin, smart contract wallets are like Ethereum. Uh, and so it, how to design one and what features we should formally enshrine into the layer one has been a topic of debate amongst Ethereum long developers for like forever. as long as I've been in, in crypto, as yes. long as I've been here in Ethereum. Uh, EIP 3074 has been a thing for a very long time. It was picked up, it was debated years ago, it was dropped, it was ignored, it got picked up again recently. Now it's getting pushed through. 
Uh, and so it's actually kind of like a monumental hurdle that's overcome because this is actually kind of like the start of increasing the scope of the sophistication of smart contract wallets that are enabled in the layer one. We are starting small as we do in Ethereum, and then we are expanding the scope as we come to consensus about what features should be enshrined on the layer one. This is like doing the thing that Ethereum is very cautious about doing, which is putting opinions and adding complexity into the layer one, but we're doing it. Uh, and so if you've ever traded a token on Uniswap that you haven't traded before, you have to go and first approve that token. Multiple and then steps. Multiple, multiple buttons steps. to press. Yep. Now this is all being bundled up into one single like smart service. So no more token approvals at the layer one. Also, this unlocks um, uh, sponsor accounts. And so you can actually have no gas in your wallet, but through smart contract wallets, you can actually have a third party pay for your gas for you. Uh, and so like you actually don't need any gas. Uh, you just have assets and somebody else pays for your gas. Uh, and there's a bunch of other features as well. Uh, but basically, like I said, it's just the big first foot in the door to unlock the entire like landscape of smart contract wallets for the Ethereum layer one. Yeah, wallet asset recovery is another thing about this. So we could have like social recovery wallets. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's great. Here, here's the thing I'm most excited about this. All right. So a bunch of people, crypto natives listening to Bankless right now, are, like they, they might have dozens of wallets, right? So the question is, what happens to those wallets? Do I have to create brand new wallets? Here's the best part. Okay. You can migrate your existing EOA wallet, same ETH address to account abstracting uh, account abstraction wallet and get all of those benefits that I, I didn't realize um, before I learned a bit more about this that it would be you know, like so backward compatible I guess mm -hmm. or like I thought I, I just assumed that we'd have to like create all new wallets and this would be right. possible in the future my legacy wallets are like all foobar but they're not you can actually like all the wallets that you've spent so much time and have so much history in uh, they can they can turn into account abstraction wallets which I think is a pretty big deal G give us a sense for when this is coming David so next ethereum hard fork okay so that's it's been approved for that but when is the next mm -hmm. ethereum hard fork well, no one really knows when. No, no one asks when is the next <laughs> yes, Ethereum hard Yes, we do. We always do. We always ask. Uh, sometime at the end of this year, probably, which means probably at the start of next year, which means probably Q2 of next year. These things tend to get delayed. Um, so think, think like early 2025. Early 2025. It, it, oh, it's yeah. just that's yeah, yeah. some nice padding, David. I'm yeah, I'm yeah. optimistic for Q1 2025 that we'll have this, yeah. but uh, we'll okay. see. You know, it's again the, the next upgrade next uh, a hard fork for Ethereum is called Pectra, which is a combination of should we even go into this? I think we should. Uh, Prague and Electra. Uh, so Electra is a star, Ryan. Prague is a city, uh, but Prague is the execution layer of Ethereum, and Electra is the consensus layer of Ethereum. Wait, Electra and is a star. Yeah, so th this is how Ethereum hard forks are named. So you, you take a city that's on planet Earth, and that is the execution layer hard fork, and then you take a star, a name of a star somewhere in the sky, and then you portmanteau them together, and that's how we name Ethereum hard forks. Did you know that? <laughs> oh, wow. No, I, I didn't know that. And how many This is stars? what happens when you let dev nerds name your hard fork. I want uh, uh, Beetlejuice, Betelgeuse, you know that star? <laughs> big, big red dwarf. <laughs> Well, so we already passed B. So uh, E uh, is, is it was A B C D. So like after Electra, it will be an F named star. An F star. With some with F, F I don't, star. Yeah. I don't know any F stars. I don't know any F stars either. No. All right. uh, well, I can't no. wait. But, but I can't. I, wait. But I bet you the E F devs do because they would. <laughs> Nerds. <laughs> Nerds. We love you guys. That's great. Uh, I'm really excited to talk about uh, what is it? You said Pectra. Pectra. Pectra yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Get the people excited about Pectra. It's coming. <laughs> Uh, all right, tell us about uh, Eigenlayer because it is it did I'm a main so last asked. week. Yeah, now mm -hmm. it's unpausing restaking deposits. What does this mean? Does this mean Floodgate is open to all the capital, all of the ETH that's that right. pour into Eigenlayer? Now you can just like, but you know, there, there's no limit. There's no, there's no <laughs> limit. There's no cap. There's no limit. Yeah. Okay. So there was twelve and a half, thirteen billion dollars of ETH and related uh, LSTs inside of Eigenlayer. It's like four, at the four, time of the cap, four million. In ETH supply, something ETH, like that? Yeah, something like that. Someone do the math for me. Uh, they are now completely just removing the cap on LSTs. Uh, and so there was never any cap on uh, native restaking. So you could always put vanilla Ether in and natively restake. And you would generally do this via LRTs like EtherFi or Renzo or whatever. Um, but now there's actually just no, for no formal caps whatsoever. Slo we've um, slowed down a little bit. Like how how high do you think? I mean, this is like at... at I mean, how at, much ETH can I can like, <laughs> take, right? take up a lot of ETH? I mean, we're at like what? You like 4%-ish of supply? Yeah. Something like uh, this? 3%. 3%. I guess that's not that much. Uh, the sure. Bitcoin ETFs already have over 3% of sure. Bitcoin supply. Sure. 
I think we could go higher. I think we could get to five, six, seven, Eigenlayer eight. is equivalent to the Bitcoin ETFs for Ethereum. That's large. <laughs> don't you think? Uh, don't you think it's that? It's that it could it could slurp up that much in terms of ETH? I guess it depends. I mean, it, it already has. It already has. No, no, no. But like, yes, it already has. But like, I'm 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 calling for like a higher number. <laughs> <laughs> I'm calling for like I I wonder say, if we'll see say a number. When you will won't. we see double digits? <laughs> When double digit we'll ETH, double digit ETH supply percentage or ETH and I, and I get percent my, percent percent wow well, ten percent okay so you need uh what is that twelve million ether and eigen we need to like triple uh man that is I don't know I don't know it, it depends really, on the AVSs it I it think. depends on the AVSs the app, it the depends on how much yeah. if you don't speak mm -hmm. eigenlayer AVS is just the the thing built on eigen top apps. of eigenlayer eigen apps. the things that that produce the yield they produce the yield, the utility they they collect the fees. They give them to the LST, LRTs, uh, and then they are collected by capital depositors. Restaking has been an absolute massive, uh, massive narrative, narrative this cycle, particularly yeah. for an Ethereum. uncontested narrative for a very long time. But let me tell you, David, something that's 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 here, whether you like it or not, <laughs> it's called alt restaking. <laughs> alt right? restaking. Well, that's what I'm calling it. I don't know if any mm -hmm. that's going to catch on, but we've got some new uh, restaking networks on the scene that are doing non-Ethereum stuff. One is called Nectar. Is it Nectar? Nectar, nectar. Okay, and then this one, uh, Karak, Karak. Uh, yeah, I don't know, Kar Karak, Karak, K A R A K. Bank listeners, you figure out how to pronounce that. B big, big raise on this one big too. Raise, uh, Karak yeah. got one billion dollars from a whole bunch of VCs to accelerate uh, universal. Now they got, they got, they got forty-eight million dollars at a one billion dollar valuation. Gosh. Man, I am a VC. I should, yeah, I you... should know how this works. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, so alt restaking, that's a uh -huh. thing. And the, the the focus, it seems to be, at least with this narrative, is non-Ethereum tokens. So Eigenlayer, the only thing you can stake inside of Eigenlayer right now is Ether, right? And so these, Or Ether derivatives, yeah. Or Ether derivatives. Mm -hmm. And these restaking networks are saying, hey, we could do all of the all mm -hmm. of the tokens. Why stop at ETH? We can do everything. There's what there's one interesting thing though here, which is like Eigenlayer is also going to do yeah. other things besides right. uh ethereum and that's been part of their their design from right. from day one is where they start with ether because it's kind of the most money like uh mm -hmm. you know like highest economic bandwidth thing uh with but, the but best also it's set. mainly the unit of account of this is Sri Ram's explanation you use ether because it's the unit of account of like the respective ecosystems because like generally the economics are denominated you have, in pay, ether. you have to pay your taxes in ether basically so you may as well right yeah, and so they don't they don't want any cross volatility risks. So you denominate your assets and your liabilities in the same unit of account. Uh, you start off by ether because that's what the Ethereum ecosystem generally denominates in. Uh, but then you can also expand to other assets because mainly you don't want to have this extra risk, which is cross asset volatility. There you go. And so this eigenlayer uh, like strategy is like, well, most things are going to be ETH denominated first, and then we'll get to like USCC things denominated later. Uh, a uh, pretty cool like little road uh, rabbit hole in the eigenlayer ecosystem is dual staking and so you would stake ether but then you would also stake the native token of a respective avs as well and so you can have both things providing security and this is like the eigenlayer like slow um slow like roadmap slow like crescendo of scope uh so you start with eth then you add like a native token of a spe uh, specific app and then eventually you just you can just do anything as well yeah well, I mean, I think it's a, a hallmark of Eigenlayer's success that they have alts now. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, yeah. you know, you're <laughs> successful when uh, you start yeah. getting uh, alternatives to your solution uh, coming aboard. So, and I do think this is going to be. It's been a super successful narrative. So, mm -hmm. of course, it was going to uh, attract competitors. And, and this is related to mostly Karak Network. Their the whole, their their whole narrative is like we you can stake anything. Nectar, the first one that we uh, talked about, uh, th their whole thing is DVT, Distributed Validator Technology. Uh, this is actually a, a pivot from Diva. Uh, so if you all remember the Diva LST project that uh, was always trying to like leverage DVT to um, kind of just be an improved version of Rocket Pool, uh, they have since pivoted into being a restaking platform that leverages DVT. Uh, so if for bankless listeners that remember that uh, that name, that, that's where it, ne Nectar came from. I'm sure we are going to be talking about restaking at uh, the Permissionless conference, mm -hmm. which, yeah. you know, anytime we get a chance to shout out Permissionless, mm -hmm. I'm going to be there. David's going to be there. Yeah. It's in October. Many of, of these projects are going to be there. We actually do have a panel about restaking uh, alt, alt restaking yeah. oh really 
Yeah, because there, there's a restaking. Well, there's Babylon on Bitcoin. There's a oh, restaking right. uh, project on Solana. Um, and so th this is actually, these aren't the first two like alt restaking ones. These are just the first two to actually also focus on Ethereum. Sriram's coming to that as well. Yep. He's coming to Permissionless. Uh, bankless listener, if you want a 10% discount, you can go get that. The code bankless10 at mm -hmm. any point in time. And uh, you like go, come to Permissionless with us. It's yeah. going to be a great conference. Yeah. We'll be in the middle of the, the bull market It'll be beautiful. Be, be good times. Be great. Bankless citizens, you guys get 30%. So if you guys are listening to this on the RSS feed or wherever you're bankless yeah, citizen, don't you get 30%. Don't settle for 10%. Don't settle for 10%. The code, is, the code is not bankless30. So <laughs> don't try that. <laughs> uh, all right. David, Immutable is doing some... Uh, are they doing... What is this? Are they doing layer three? More chains. If we're, more talk chains. we're talking about more chains. More chains on Ethereum. It's layer threes, so, right? Am yeah, I right? So, yeah. So they are building what is called the, the Immutable Nexus. Okay. Uh, the ecosystem of gaming chains. Uh, and so, of course, they are building out chains for the games that are part of the immutable ecosystem. There's a lot of games coming online right now. I was actually, uh, I don't think you're much of a gamer these days, Ryan, but there's this uh, Dark Souls game. Are you, are you familiar mm. with Dark Souls? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's this Dark Souls because like it, it created its whole entire genre because it's such an awesome series of games. There's a crypto-esque, not even esque, there's a Dark Souls game where all the assets are on chain. Really? Yeah. yeah What's yeah. this called? The Fabled. Yeah, I actually demoed it, it at um, at uh, ETH Denver last year. Uh, it How was we're a not little, hearing was, about these things. Are people just no users? Different, people different aren't world. Them? Different. No, there. No. Oh, this this one isn't out yet. It's on. It's on Steam with a coming soon. You can like demo it if you want to. I think you, you can like jump through some hoops. Uh, Steam I remember is totally fine with like uh, crypto games because I know uh, some platforms have not been. Well, this hasn't launched, but it's got a Steam page. It's got a Steam page for this game that is very elegant. The graphics are beautiful. It was a little bit clunky when I played it, but I played it back in 2023, and so like. A year over a year ago, so I'm assuming this it's been. Is, is this going to be on? Is Fable going to be on Immutable? Or is I think it so. The, the Fabled, I think so. I think it's oh, an Immutable okay. game. I, I don't know. Right. I'll ask Robbie. Anyways, uh, my, it might have its own chain because that's what this whole announcement is. Uh, and so you are as a game get to have your own zk EVM because the costs of chains are just like so low these days. Uh, like a, spinning up a chain with Conduit, you can go to Conduit and just spin up an OP stack chain for three thousand dollars a month. It's probably a little bit more what, for a zk is, EVM. This is a zk EVM chain that settles on top of immutable which is a layer two which settles on, on top of uh, ethereum right so we got chains on chains again it's a layer three david i found kind another of. layer three it's not a, it's not exactly a layer three dgen is a strict layer three okay. uh the zk evm it's more of a uh, fractal mesh network so it's a little bit more horizontal so yeah. there's not strict settling down to one specific chain it's actually all kind of like settles together yeah. but you do get dedicated throughput gaming is like one of the most reasons why you would want your own sovereign chain because you don't want to share block space with a different game uh, mm -hmm. And so you get perfect customization. Uh, you get to like, you know, reconfigure what your chain looks like. Uh, you can configure native tokens for gas and staking. So your game can have a native token. Um, and then you get the set of ecosystem partners out of Immutable. So congrats to Immutable. David, I know you are uh, one to stay on the frontier of crypto, mm -hmm. aren't you? So yeah. I, I wanted to hear about some of your recent frontier experiences. Yeah. Uh, I think <laughs> I think you're coming up with podcasts on these because I've been tuning into the Bankless Premium feed and I caught uh, one of the, well, I haven't listened to it yet, but it's mm -hmm. waiting for me on the feed where you go and you talk about uh, crypt the crypto, the game. Mm-hmm. Let's start there. What is crypto the game? Because I've been uh, among like my crypto friend circles. Uh, everyone's talking about this thing, mm -hmm. and it's been described to me as like um, Survivor meets crypto. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's about like right. reality TV show type of thing. Like, what is this thing? Yeah, think of it like an MMO, multi massive multiplayer online uh, Survivor um, reality TV show with economic <laughs> reward. Like, do I get the the prize for like if I win? Yeah, economic reward is like putting it into like crypto terms. Uh, you get a prize for winning the game, but oh, yeah. it's, it's I guess not I could like just say prize. <laughs> yes, it's a prize. There, it's not like Axie Infinity where there's like an economic game. It's much more like a reality TV show where like so the the way that the game works. This is crypto the game. There has been two seasons, so we have seen two of these things happen. Season one lasted ten days. Season two lasted ten days. Season one had about three hundred players. Season two had about eight hundred players, and you put in a point one ETH entrance fee into the pot 
and then the winner gets the entire pot minus the uh, cut for the the game devs mm. uh, who put in a ton of work building this thing. Uh, and so it, it's also like it's very much like Squid Games, you know, the Netflix Squid Games yeah, things yeah. where everyone like it starts off with like a thousand people or whatever, and then it gets whittled down and whittled down and whittled down, and then the last one gets but all the people money. People aren't getting killed here. What they're just getting voted voted off, right? Voted yeah, they the get game. they get eliminated. Yeah, and so, so it's a social it's a social game. It's a social game. Yeah, man, that sounds and, terrible. This just sounds like high school. I don't want to do this. Why would I do this? <laughs> Apparently. People People are having a ton of fun. And so like, just, okay, there's the actual game, which is like once per day, there's a trial that you have to go do, like a little mini game. Like you have to go complete a quest or something. You have to do an on, on-chain on scavenger hunt. Uh, sometimes there's an in a real life scavenger hunt. Uh, there's, there's a bunch of different games. Every 24 hours is like the same. Uh, there's a new game. But then at the end of every 24 hours, there's a voting period to vote people off the island, like vote oh, to wow. eliminate. Wow, and so you, you, brutal. And so you are in a, you are given a, a group, you're grouped up at the very beginning. And so you and your group have to like coordinate and you generally trust each other. But you also know that eventually you're going to have to vote some of these people off. But mainly since you're grouped up, you want to vote other tribes off first. Uh, and so like so, it's a game, it's a game of elimination. Why don't you do this? Have you done this? I have not done this. I have heard... One of the things that I like about this actually is like it's a very uh, equitable game. Oh, so it's like, not like a popularity contest. No, it's definitely no. In fact, popularity is like kind of a curse because then you're a target. Oh, yeah. Wait, so is that what you're saying? Uh, yeah. So I have been you're told too popular that, to use it, David. Is that I have been told break? that if I entered <laughs> the game as a player, that there would just be a huge target on my back, just because like, oh, David, let's just vote him off. Let's just get him out of here. <laughs> I could see that, you know, yeah. given, given, given some of your comments on Bankless, I, I could definitely see that. Made some enemies, David. All right. Yeah. Well, that's cool. So mm -hmm. do you you think it's cool? You think it's a, something that Bankless listeners might be interested in on the frontier? Well, I mean, we have our own employees who are like, can't get their I know eyes are. off of I the game. I know. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. Some so proof is in is. the pudding. It's, it's one of the most popular things to come out. Um so yeah, you season did. three it will happen in like four to six weeks or something. And if you want to find out more, David did like a 20 minute episode or something. It's on the mm -hmm. Bankless premium feed. If yeah. you're a Bankless citizen, you have access to that right now. I'm going to actually listen to that and see if it's a, uh, I won't have time for it. I'm not going to do it. I'll get yeah, apparently anyway, it's very but... consuming for how much, uh, yeah, yeah. But like the, the winner got 72 ether of, of season two. That's big. That's pretty cool. That's big. Um, yeah. All right. What's, what's the other thing you're on the frontier of these days? Okay, so this is the Zero X Maki project. For those who don't know the lore around Zero X Maki, he was the first person to step up and run the whole sushi swap um, uh, uh, project after Chef Nomi rugged. Uh, so generally, like very technically talented, beloved. He didn't rug dev. anyone, though, right? Zero Chef X Maki. Ma Zero no. X Maki did not. Chef Nomi. No, did. He was he was the good guy in crypto history. Right? Yes, yeah, Zero X Maki was the one that like fixed the ship of sushi swap after yeah. uh, chef nomi like effed it up yeah. but this is this is ancient 2021 so so ancient. Know this. yeah, yeah okay. uh anyways he's been involved with a bunch of stuff very well respected beloved dev uh has been uh hyping this thing up called hero glyphs and no one knows what this is because it's not released yet and but it will be by the time it's released when bankless listeners listen to it because it's releasing tomorrow uh and so it, it's purported it's touted to be this thing that helps the decentralization of ethereum uh the ethereum validator network mm -hmm. so it is a mechanism that rewards decentralization it rewards solo stakers over like organizational or institutional stakers uh, and everyone's like how do you do that that is an impossible nut to crack no one's been able to figure out how to do that like how do you even identify solo stakers uh, and so like, I spent like 30 minutes talking with him it's not on a podcast but um, if this thing um, does blow up maybe we will do a podcast it's pretty clever. So basically how this works, you know graffiti space in the beacon chain, Ryan? Yeah, I do know this. Okay, so in the beacon chain, th when you as a proposer of a block, as a ETH validator, there is this thing called graf graffiti. And actually, I don't know why Core Devs put this in there, and Maki said he didn't know why either, but like there are is this 32-character space for you to put a little graffiti every time you uh, propose a block to Ethereum. So if you propose a block, you get to say like something, something, something. Mm -hmm. uh, when when Bankless proposes a block, because we run our validators, uh, it says Bankless was here. Super yeah, that's creative. right. That's Genius. right. I forgot we did that. Yeah. <laughs> so so clever. So yeah, clever. Super original. <laughs> I dare him. you to copy us. It's amazing. <laughs> Anyways, uh, that is kind of like, well, because anything is data availability that has characters in it. And so 
I'm shaking my head. <laughs> <laughs> and so what uh, what Xerox Machi is doing is he is using graffiti space to produce like ordinals type things where but except instead of producing ordinals, you can actually mint a token on a layer two by encoding using a very like similar to ENS coding scheme. You can like code in a token. So like dollar sign uh, bonkless. You just create then, a syntax for it and you stuff it in a block in a place yeah. where like it's uh -huh. not supposed to be. Data's yeah. not supposed to be here. This uh -huh. is exactly, I'm yeah. surprised that this is such Bitcoin ordinals energy. I'm, I'm totally. surprised Casey uh, Rotomore didn't do this. Rotomore isn't doing this, but it's. <laughs> yeah, it's, but he's a Bitcoiner, right? Yeah, but it's the same kind of approach. It's the same concept. It's, it's the same like, concept. There's this empty data field. We can and put we can, stuff we can in put, it. We can put some tokens in there. <laughs> if we if we can just create a, a scheme and a way to decipher it, then like we can uh -huh. stuff stuff in it. So that's what yeah. he's doing. Yeah, yeah. Well, how does this benefit solo stakers? That's the part Be I don't understand. Because you can't claim these. So you, you the who gets these tokens? So the token is minted when you propose a block and you put the token like ticker yeah. into the uh, into the graffiti. Yeah. But it, it, the token is minted on a layer two. So you actually don't touch the layer one. But it's minted to the address that your withdrawal credentials is set to. Oh, and cool. So, if so a solo staker generally has their withdrawal address is set to like an, an EOA that they own, but like Lido does not. Like Lido has it set to a DAO. Like Rockable has it set to their org. Any sort of institution has it set to a smart contract. And in this protocol, in Hieroglyphs, if your withdrawal address is a smart contract, it's invalid. It is only valid for people who have their withdrawal addresses set to uh, an individual EOA. EOAs. So it's not a perfect targeting of solo stakers. So it's like he didn't perfectly I get it. I get it. Uh, crack the nut, but like it's directionally correct. And it, it's going to create a bunch of meme coins that only solo stakers have access this to. This sounds so much like runes to me. It's it, like, it basically is runes, but using yeah. Ethereum beacon chain. It's going to be the, the ERC20 killer is here. It's a hieroglyph. <laughs> We're going to encode it in graffiti. Wow. Okay, that's I think it's, cool. I think it's pretty, I don't we'll know if it's going to take, it takes take off. off. We'll see, it's, it's, see if it takes off. It's easy for it to take something like that to take mm. off on Bitcoin because what other option you have? Yeah, I have no This is a little option. bit different in Ethereum, but yeah. it could be good for meme coins. Who knows? I'm sure yeah. you know, like, we'll, we'll have to see. D the meme is good. Update us on uh, Solana. So they had like they had, <laughs> is this my job? <laughs> yes, uh, you are our bankless Res Solana Resident correspondent. Solana responder. So Solana was having some problems with uh, all of the volume it was receiving. In particular, mm -hmm. there was a, a project called Or that I think was like quote unquote spamming the network. Anyway, mm -hmm. the end result was people Solana users couldn't get transactions through. Users you got just, pushed out. Yeah, they got pushed out. You keep hitting the button and fail transaction, fail transaction. There's supposed to be an update for this. They deployed the update. Am I right about this? Like, what is the update? What happened? Did it work? Okay, so Solana version 1.17.31, 1 uh, which is this, I think, short-term interim fix for what is a longer, more sustainable fix, uh, is now deployed. I think the validators are now on this version. Uh, I'm not going to pretend that I know what's in this version, so I'm just going to read a tweet from somebody who does know. If I just read this out, it would just be a bunch of networking stuff. Uh, so a bunch of networking stuff <laughs> in the Solana stack, and now it works better. Well, that was the problem, right? There was still, like <laughs> One part of the problem was the the um, the network work um tech that they had chosen just like wasn't 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 kind of like scaling right. to the level that they needed so they swapped that out there there's right. some other problems like economic sustainability right. problems but sure. what i'm hearing from solana users uh it's been a little bit since i used the solana network but what i'm hearing from solana power users is uh it's kind of like cleared up and par part yeah. of this by the way is or has stopped you know like this chain mm -hmm. that was spamming everyone yeah. has kind of stopped right. so um but also this this network um uh, change was uh, somewhat effective so yeah. there you go we got our hot okay, so fix in basically so since solana does not have a mempool what becomes the mempool is like the networking layer of solana aka the internet and uh, so that is the solana mempool is like the networking layer are you asking uh, so me this because no, no i'm no i'm telling You're you telling this. me that this, okay. so, well, this is what happens when you when you delete a mempool is that it moves into the networking layer uh, so it's just like the message passing, messaging uh, protocol around Solana. So they're just improving that. David, you want to hear about a stablecoin bill? I love it. Tell me more. You don't love it. It sucks. Oh. Oh, okay. It really sucks. Sad. This is uh, Senator Lummis and Senator uh, Gillibrand bill. It says introduce a bipartisan landmark legislation to create regulatory frameworks for stable coins. Sounds really good, right? Yeah, we, need... we do. We do want regulatory frameworks for stable coins. So okay, so what's up? I I saw this and I was kind of excited. Hey, is it finally time? Are we getting like good uh, regulation uh, around stable coins? I asked our crypto lawyer friends, um, and my first question was, of course, where I always start with stable coins. 
it, legislation is, uh, does this kill die? Their answer was, yes, it kills die. Oh, <laughs> it, it, okay, it, so it's It kills bad. any kind of algorithmic uh, stable coin. Followed by my like crypto lawyer well, uh, contest. Dai's not an algorithmic stable coin. <laughs> they, but they, they say it is. Yeah. Oh, okay. It kills right. die, right? It, like also Luna and everything like that, but also. It, wait, let let me guess. It kills everything that doesn't have US dollars in a bank somewhere. It might even call kill USDC, David. All oh, right. That's God, how silly why? this is. All right. Anyway, so the, the overarching comment from crypto lawyers, because, you know, Senator uh, Lummis has been a friend of crypto, so called, mm -hmm. uh, with friends like these who needs energy enemies all right that was like the comment because like mm -hmm. this is bad actually uh it kills every stable that's not issued by a bank or a chartered trust which i don't think that's usdc that oh it's just they're not a bank. The power to the bank yep and then also it has these like extra uh, territorial provisions apparently so it's kind of like exporting it's imagining that the entire world revolves around the u.s and we could just like export u.s law uh to stable coin transactions that are completely outside of the u.s so it's bad. It's not great. I asked if this was like the bill that's going to go forward. It has some support. It's very early. Um, people are still digesting it. There are other different bills that are in some sort of like formulation phase. So hopefully we just like reform this bill. We get the, you know, like all the stupid stuff out of it and we get the good stuff back into it. And it's a real bill, but it's like discouraging. It's discouraging because right. like... We, it kind of help it kinda us just with makes regulation, me think... Congress, and that's this is what they give right. us. Right. No thanks. Don't help us with the regulation, then. Like just, it, it, we keep on saying, like, hey, we ultimately need to get legislation from the Congress. Yeah, and I'm always assuming, like, sure, they're going to throw like seven bad bills at us, and then the eighth one will finally be good, and we'll just get that one in. But that also was like four bills ago. Yeah, uh, well, and so it kind of just feels like, oh yeah, we actually have to like get a good bill, and we haven't gotten that ever. This is Jake Chervinsky. The bill published today is deeply flawed. It appears to ban nearly everything except a narrow band of centralized custodial stable coins. This would be far worse than the status quo. Ah, <laughs> uh, sick. sick. You want to run for Congress, David? Let's do it. No, absolutely. You and I. Not. Let's go fix this. Uh, I don't. I don't. Mr. Don't Hoffman goes me. to Washington. We'll fi we'll fix it all. I would not survive a day in Washington. <laughs> I would get chewed up by those politicians. Uh, let's talk about raises, David. Two startup raises that we want to highlight out of the Bankless Ventures universe this week. Aligned Layer, raising $2.6 million. Congrats, guys. What is Aligned Layer? Uh, Aligned Layer is an AVS, which is outside of the Eigenlayer ecosystem. It is basically a sidecar to Ethereum for super cheap ZK verifications. This is in the ZK universe Basically, just like how we have blob space on the Ethereum layer one, EIP 4844, eventually, in the fullness of time, Ethereum also wants to enshrine specific ZK circuits to have inside of the feature set of the Ethereum layer one to benefit rollups, right? More secure ZK settlement, just like a feature for layer twos and just people to use. Because, uh, because uh, ZK EVMs, ZK rollups mm -hmm. are consuming that service right now, right? Totally. You, you have to get your ZK proof verified on Ethereum and it's expensive right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what if we just actually dedicated a ZK circuit as a part of the Ethereum protocol that layer two, ZK layer twos could very trustlessly just leverage for trustless perfect settlement of their layer twos. This is something that will eventually be inside of the Ethereum protocol. But the total scope of all of these ZK circuits that could exist is completely limitless. And so for everything else that's not making it into the Z Ethereum layer one, there's a lined layer. Uh, an, an external AVS for any sort of extremely cheap, extremely fast ZK proving. Kind of like how Eigen DA is similar to Ethereum DA, but using Eigenlayer as an AVS. Uh, Aligned Layer is an Eigenlayer AVS except for ZK circuit proving. Yeah, the net is this is going to be make um, proving and verification really, really cheap, which cheap. hopefully will enable a massive ecosystem of new ZK apps. Right. Like a ZK rollup is just one type of ZK app, and we haven't seen what's possible in kind of this whole sphere. Second up is Nebra, which is a ZK proof aggregator. So all of these ZK rollups who submit proofs down to the Ethereum layer one, they pay for that. They pay to put their proof down on the Ethereum layer one. But a ZK snark is succinct, as in it is a very specific number of characters. That's what the sync succinct is here. Uh, what if Nebra just consumed other people's ZK proofs and then aggregated them all together and spit out another ZK proof? 
to settle all that singular ZK proof down to the Ethereum layer one. Economies of scale is more cheap for all of these ZK proofs. Uh, and so Nibra ZK proof aggregator raised 4.5 million. Uh, again, one of a Bankless Ventures portfolio company. So congrats to Aligned Layer and Nibra. This is all part of the trend of going from like compute to trustless compute. I mean, there, there are some ZK bulls out there who think basically the entire internet is going to be ZKified. I'm right? one of them. Right? And so yeah. like that that's why we need Everything abundant- Everything is ZK. We need abundant ZK uh, mm -hmm. verification. We need it to be super cheap. Yeah. Uh, it's, ZK it's, on your phone, ZK on your browser, ZK on your smart refrigerator, just because like if everything will ZK be ZK everywhere. ZK yeah. everywhere. David, tell me about the meme of the week, man. Let's end with this. <laughs> okay, so uh, this is uh, one of the greatest like uh, tweets I saw this week. Tim Coplin, so tweeting at the classic shot chaser line. Uh, and Avi... Avi Eisenberg, if you guys remember this name, <laughs> who is the person who did some on-chain market manipulation of, of, I believe, Mango mar Markets. If the meme, I executed a highly profitable trading strategy means anything to you, this is that guy. Uh, and right after this individual uh, manipulated some economic oracles to exploit Mango Markets, he tweets out, what are you going to do? Arrest me? <laughs> and this is when, right after he just exploited... Uh, 2022. Uh, in 2022, he exploited Mango Markets for like some millions of dollars. Uh, and here is a picture from a, an article that went out uh, the Justice last week. Federal jurors in New York on Thursday found Avi Eisenberg, 28, guilty of commodities fraud, commodities manipulation, and wire fraud for his actions on October 11th, 2022, when his trading boosted the prices of future contract by 1,300% in 20 minutes. Sentencing is set for July 29th. He was indeed arrested. <laughs> uh, crimes are still crimes when you do them in crypto. PSA, it's a bankless nation. So if I if I steal your crypto uh, money, David, it's still stealing, huh? That is still theft. If you steal crypto from someone, it is still theft. If you manipulate right. markets, it is still illegal commodities market manipulation. Crimes well, are still crimes. When you do them in crypto, That's public reminder. Know. I thought all of this was like imaginary money, but like it's good to know that um, this is serious stuff. Uh, crimes are crimes. All right, guys, let's end with this. Of course, you know, crypto is risky. You could lose what you put in, but we are headed west. This is the frontier. It's not for everyone, but we're glad you're with us on the bankless journey. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot.